This morning, I think that it's probably the case that everybody may, you may have a little bit of reprieve, but for the most part, everybody is consistently wondering what is going to happen next and how we're going to deal with the time frame that we live in. I really don't know how um, people are looking at the fact that many schools did not open. You keep hearing these false narratives about something is going to happen that's going to cause a shift and then it doesn't happen. And so um, I know that Antoine told me that they, they were doing virtual. And so another one of those instances where it was said that it was going to happen and then it did not. So that brings us to 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. The children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to, do, to, do, to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. It is a very difficult time. I mean, it's a very difficult thing to actually know, to know what to do, when to do it, exactly what is the thing that God has in mind, if you think that God is in charge. And so I have been paying attention to this. We've been paying attention to this because, y'all, we are constantly, I know you know this, we are constantly looking for avenues. We're looking for events that other people would look at differently so that we would be able to be ahead of the game. What are we talking about being ahead of the game? That is getting information to people right when they need it. Circumstance change, and you never know who is going to change their thinking process, become interested when they weren't interested before. February 29th, New York Times headlines. Coronavirus fears reverberate, reverberate across global economy. When we saw that, we were very much aware that this could be one of those things, when you see the word fear, you immediately know that people act differently when that happens. And I think we can all remember when the Twin Towers were struck and <laughs> that was one of the most striking events I think I've ever seen is to see Congress on the steps of one, wherever they were, uh, either the Senate, I'm not sure where they were, they were on the steps of something and they were all singing Amazing Grace or something of that nature. There are a lot of people in the two branches of government that I doubt Amazing Grace has come across their lips in years before that. And so we're basically thinking about individuals like Issachar who know what to do. And this morning I want to introduce a psychologist. His name is Rollo May. And I want to give you his little bit of background because I want you to, to recognize what kind of person this is before I give you his quote. Rollo Mayo, PhD in clinical psychology from Teachers College at Columbia University in 1949. This was his last degree. He already had a bachelor's degree in English and had taught English for several years. He was ordained as a minister. Rollo Reese May was born in 1909 and died in 1994. At the age of 85, his parents divorced but his sister also had schizophrenia, was diagnosed with tuberculosis, and recovered at a sanitarium over the course of 18 months. Now, that's not his sister. I meant to have a, a space in there. His sister was uh, schizophrenic. He was diagnosed with tuberculosis, and he recovered in a sanitarium over the course of 18 months. And this is when he decided to actually study clinical psychology. And he's famous for a book called Love and Will. Now, I'd say the guy has experienced quite a lot of different things, gone from one end of the spectrum to the other, psychology from a minister to a psychologist, which doesn't really happen all that much so when you think about the things that you have to actually study. He said, perplexed people have to make sense out of their world or their world will destroy them. Now, y'all, that is a very, very true statement. If you can't bring some order 
if chaos and disorganization continue, the psychologists actually say that a person who has cognitive dissonance, where you actually have two different things that you're believing at the same time. And what do you mean two different things that you're believing? Well, you, let's say that you're saying you're a Christian, but you're also acting in another way. Sooner or later, one or the other is going to have to take uh, uh, center stage, forefront, or you're going to end up having, they even say that cognitive dissonance, if you continue with it, it will create schizophrenia. You will end up being such a perplexed individual from actually living out two different lives, you can end up having schizophrenia. And so, as we are hearing headline after headline, you know, I really, in a way, I envy the people that were living in the Great Depression in this, for this one reason. They did not have the information overload that we have. And I don't know how you are. I have stopped watching the news a long time ago. I cannot take it. The constant barrage of all kinds of stuff that I have no idea whether any of it is factual or not. I just know it is an organization that makes money and they've got to sell commercials. And so I cannot take that kind of stuff. So this is what we're looking at this morning. And we're thinking, we're saying to ourselves, okay, what should we do? Well, what if the headline, instead of saying what it said, that fear reverberates all over the globe, economic fear all over the globe, what if the headline read, the Smiths move to Babylon? Now, I know what you're thinking, and I intended it to be that way. What in the world are you talking about? The Smiths move to Babylon. In 2 Kings 24, 11, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city and his servants did besiege it. And notice, and he carried away all Jerusalem and all the princes and all the mighty men of valor and smiths. Now, these are not folk that are trying to outdo the Jones. These are individuals who have crafts. They're carpenters. These are not carpenters, but there are carpenters. There are smiths. This is a real biblical verse. This is who actually was taken away into Babylonian captivity. Now, this morning as we're studying this, you know that this was a difficult time. And everybody recognizes that throughout historical records, it doesn't matter who you're reading. If you're reading the Bible or you're reading secular historians, individuals like Josephus, who is a very respected Jew who was a historian during the time of the Romans when they destroyed Jerusalem, it doesn't matter who you're reading. You will, you will see constant upheaval in the Middle East. Individuals overtaking one country, taking another, and another taking another. This is a tremendous battleground where Iraq and Iran and Turkey and all of that is. And it's a battleground now. The consistent fighting right now over water. A lot of people think it's just, it is just oil. But the Turkish people are putting dams on the Tigris and Euphrates, and they're going to end up starving the rest of these people down, down, <coughs> excuse me, down spring. It is a constant thing. And people had to deal with this. But in this particular instance, they have been being told that if they did not continue to stop acting like the other nations, that they were going to have be taken into captivity. The ten tribes of Israel, the ones that headquartered in Samaria, they've already been taken away into, into Assyria, capital Nineveh, today's Iraq. These individuals are already gone, so there's no reason why they shouldn't have believed it, but they... The, the tribes of Judah did not seem to take heed, and as a result, they're being carried away into Babylonian captivity. Now, I want you to think about this. What would you think if the headlines were reading? Would you think that was even an important headline? The Smiths are going to Babylon. Well, probably you wouldn't, and probably most people who are Bible readers don't realize that somebody actually make some order out of this. If you're reading 2 Kings 24, I can tell you, you might as well just forget it from the standpoint 
of really getting a grasp on what this means. Why the Smiths? Why these individuals? Why are they being taken out of, uh, out of Jerusalem? Well, Jeremiah actually writes about it. He is the prophet that is speaking to them. He's been speaking to them for 23 years. And Jeremiah writes, or in his account, he actually writes of the same historical event, but listen to how he puts it. The Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. After that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah, and the carpenters, and the smiths from Jerusalem, and had brought them to Babylon. One basket had a very good had very good figs, even like the figs that are first ripe. And the other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs, good figs, very good. And the, and the evil, very evil. They cannot be eaten. They are so evil. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, like those good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. For I will set my eyes upon them for good. I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them, and I will not pull them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up, and I will give them an heart to know me that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. Now, Joey made the point in his class, what if we end up having to basically run out of here? I've used several scenarios throughout time, not during the coronavirus, but several different situations where we talked about what if we had to go to the border for this reason or that reason and take it up and inhabit it somewhere else. And all of a sudden now, the news, which thank you very much, Joy, for telling me all that stuff. I'm trying to block it out. I'm hearing all of these, um, these militias are trying to form, and there are individuals who want to see another civil war, and individuals may have to move out. I know there are people moving from everywhere. I talked to one of the top, um, the top realtors here in town, and... He and his mother both told me that places are selling like crazy here in Henry County. Why? People in Philadelphia, people in New York, they're moving out of there, moving here. Why? Because the danger level is up and the sickness is up. They don't want to live in those places, and so they're moving into places like this. So basically he is telling them, look, the Babylonians are taking you to Babylon because I'm going to do what I said I was going to do. God eventually, just in a few chapters after, or a few verses after chapter 24 in, in 2 Kings, he ends up sending back one of the captains of Nebuchadnezzar and they burn the temple. Historical records will tell you that this actually happened. There's nobody can deny that there is a temple up under the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. Well, where did that temple come from? Where did the layers of the temple come from? Well, one of them was Herod's temple that was destroyed in AD 70 by the Romans. The other one that's under that, it had to exist from some time or other. Archaeologists say it was Solomon's temple. What happened to it? This is what happened to it. Nebuchadnezzar sent his captain down there. He killed the remainder of individuals, left only the poor individuals to be vine dressers, take care of the land, took all of the furniture and all of the gold and the silver that was inside of the temple of Solomon back to, to Babylon. And he then brought the reigning king, whose name was Zedekiah, to Ribla, and he put his eyes out right after he killed his three sons in front of him because of him being rebellious to Nebuchadnezzar's rules. So here's my question. What should we do in times like these? Well, it depends on what you think about the times. How are you looking at the times? How should individuals who have the minds of Issachar, how, should they, how did they look at the times? Well, I can guarantee you they don't look at the times like everybody else is looking at the times. Everybody else is saying, woe is us. Now, when we were talking about the psychologist a minute ago, we need to realize, y'all, we have got to realize 
that there are many things that are in our head that were put there by somebody other than our own figuring things out. And in the Bible, they are called fables. Now, I'm going to just go ahead and give a, a quick uh, look at one of these just so you can see it. 1 Timothy 1, 4. We'll go and just look at the original language just for a second. Timothy 1, 4. Neither give heed to fables. We can look, drop here and see the original language. This is the word for myth in the Greek. So, look at this. When the Bible talks about fables, he is at, they are actually using the Greek word myth. Neither give heed to myths and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Jews are still doing this today. Endless genealogies. Have you heard of the Cohen brothers? Maybe you saw some movie with the filter, I hope, that was... Uh, a product of the Cohen brothers. The word Cohen actually means priest. They think that they are going to be the family of the Levitical priesthood when the temple comes back. There ain't going to be no temple coming back. But nevertheless, genealogies, they're constantly, we're talking about their records and who was from whom. So they would know where they were going to move if they got to go back to the promised land. 1 Timothy 4, 7, but refuse profane and old wives fables, wives, myths, and ex exercise thyself rather unto godliness. And 2 Timothy 4, 4, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto myths. Now, here's what I'm trying to demonstrate, y'all, is this business about being perplexed about the world that, in which we live. If we don't fix that perplexity about the world, that world will destroy our well-being. That's just the way it is. If you don't get some kind of peace at some time, you know, there's a lot of people turn to drugs and alcohol and just all kinds of different things. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that they don't have things fixed in their head because of things like old wives' myths, old wives' tales. For uh, first, uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 14, neither giving he heed to Jewish fables or myths and commandments of men that turn from the truth. For 2 Peter 1.16, For we have not followed cunningly devised myths when we made known unto you the power and come of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, let's get another authority in here. Notice this. This is, comes from a book called Preaching with Imagination, and it's by a guy named Wearsby. Wearsby is a good researcher. He's the one that pointed out um, uh, Rollo a moment ago. And in this particular section, towards the end of his book, he said, by clinging to these myths, like Cinderella, like the Lone Ranger, you realize how many of these movies and different things of this nature have been put into our head through our lives, and we're watching them as a kid from Walt Disney or whoever. A lot of the ever after, happy ever after, it's a myth. And so if your mind is filled with that mythological language or thought process and your life doesn't turn out happy ever after, what do you do? You end up having a midlife crisis around 50 because you're trying to figure out why isn't ever after coming because Walt Disney is not the designer of this world. So he says by clinging to these myths people consciously or unconsciously reject or resist the truth and the preaching of the word does them no good. Psychiatrists tell us that healing can begin when patients recognize the metaphor or metaphors that control their lives. Happy ever after. Once you, it's very doubtful that you're going to find a really good psychologist who will tell you the truth, even though as the one we started with, uh, Mayo, um, Rollo, Rollo was an ordained minister, but there's no telling what kind of religion he was teaching. When you get on the couch and they start trying to work on you, and figure out what's wrong with you. He himself was an existentialist. Subjectivism, how do you feel? I know we've all seen these movies where somebody gets on the couch and the person says something and then the psychologist says, well, how do you feel about that? That's existential psychology. It's more about your subjective feelings about how the world is developing as opposed to what is really the truth. But look at what this guy is saying. When the patient recognizes the metaphors or metaphors that control their lives, and so this morning, we've got to decide, 
is it the case that we have metaphors that we're clinging to and we're hoping things are going to get back, here comes a cliche, to normal? What is normal? Normal is a relative term. If you were living in the Great Depression, what was normal? If you're living coming out of the Great Depression, what was normal? World War II, constant upheaval, Korean War. We have had a relatively long period of peace compared to individuals that lived before me, I'm 60, the Vietnam War, and then the Cold War, all of this kind of stuff. And so normal is a very relative term. Now he goes on to say, it's the story myth that keeps people going when they feel like giving up. But if the story is a fable, then the climax will be a catastrophe instead of, and they lived happily ever after. Biblical preaching involves replacing in the imaginations of our people the make-believe the make -believe of myth with the reality of logos or the word. Greek word for what Jesus was said to be the word living in the flesh. A reality that satisfies both the heart and mind. Once upon a time must become in the beginning God. Instead of once upon a time in the beginning God. Before people can live authentic lives that are rooted in reality. So when we prepare our message we must discover how the text attacks and destroys the myths people live by. Myths are robbing them of reality. So, as, as a person matures and their parents have told them all the different things, and I'm not faulting parents for what they tell us. Our parents were young when they started telling us stuff, were they not? They were telling us what their parents were telling them. They were young and they were telling us what life was going to be like. And then when we get in our 40s, we're like, who in the world were these people listening to? It ain't nothing like they said it was going to be. This is exactly what he's saying. Myths, at, myths actually are robbing us of our reality. Now, what does that mean? What it means is if persons will actually realize that reality is what we deal with, not what we think is supposed to happen because somebody has filled our heads with myths. Now, what are we going to do? How are we going to do that? We're basically saying this morning, that's what the Bible is actually for. When we saw the smiths going to Babylon, you, if you just read uh, 2 Kings 24, you would say, wow, that's awful. Those individuals all going into Babylon, that's not awful. Jeremiah puts a spin on it and says, you're going to actually be okay in Babylon. And those of you who know biblical uh, history, you know that Daniel was in Babylon, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in Babylon, and as a result of those individuals being in Babylonian captivity and Persian captivity, those individuals had a chance to actually know the Jehovah of the Bible. And these people stayed there 70 years. In commencement address, in a commencement address at Yale University on 11 June 1962, President John F. Kennedy said, this is a very good, the great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. You know, the times Kennedy lived in were very difficult times, and Johnson, after him, individuals had all kinds of persistent, persuasive, unrealistic beliefs about how race should be handled up to this time. These were some turbulent times. Why? Because of the myths that had been promoted and the things that people pursued. He goes on to say, when Paul contemplated a visit to Rome, he wrote, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, for the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Now, I think the President Kennedy's statement is extremely useful in that we are not always able to actually see that a thing is a lie because it comes to us in the form of a myth. What is a myth? An old wives tale, fables, things that come down to us. Now, what I'd like to suggest this morning is what is a door? Now you're probably saying this is as bad as the Smiths go to Babylon. What is a door? Who recognizes them? 
1 Corinthians 16, 9. For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. Now, wait a minute. If we're talking about a door of opportunity, and we are, that's what he's talking about. A door of utterance, a chance to actually speak, a chance to get things into people's head when the myth is actually exploding. For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. Well, if there is a great door of opportunity, a very great and effectual situation where we can be effectual, then where's this adversary business coming from? Those, don't, those two don't go together. Yes, they do. This is reality. A door of opportunity doesn't mean that you just got an inside track on the stock, line, uh, stock market and no, nothing is going to happen, no turns, nothing. That's reality. Look at this. Philippians 1.12. Paul says, this is the way the Christian thinks. But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my, in my, so that my bonds in Christ are made manifest in all the palace and in all other places, and many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul is basically saying, I'm in prison but in case you haven't heard, I actually was given a house of my own free of charge by the Roman government until they get around to prosecuting me. And he's been able to teach. You might say, that just doesn't sound realistic. Well, can I give you one that's closer to home? You know that when Micah was arrested for criminal trespass, first time criminal trespass, and was actually prosecuted by the city of Danville and sentenced Y'all remember them, the, the d district attorney going straight to sentencing? Your Honor, I suggest two years in the state penitentiary. Well, someone might say that is not a door of opportunity. This past year, when people were talking to Caleb about trying to arrest them in Reedsville, Caleb brought up, started talking about the Danville trial, and he said, we've all heard about the Danville trial. Oh, yeah? I didn't know that. I didn't know these people in North Carolina were talking about the fact that our lawyer beat the city of Dan Danville. Some individuals are actually, I know I'm much more bold in regard to whether or not we can get away with what we're trying to get away with. What is that? Continuing to meet as Christians, continuing to be evangelistic. How are we looking at the things that are happening to us? A door that has adversaries? Is that the kind of thing that you normally would consider to be a door of opportunity? Well, look at this. Luke 13, 24, the author of this business, that was Paul a minute ago, the author of this business said, strive to enter at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. The word straight is from the Greek word agonizomai. Who does not recognize that word? Agony? That word agony is right here. Agonize to enter in at the straight gate. Going in the correct way. The word straight is not a straight line like our, uh, our middle aisle here. It's like the Straits of Magellan. It is a very difficult area and you have to agonizomize, strive to enter in. For many I say unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able. So when we start thinking about a door of utterance we need to realize what that means. Now, y'all, perspective. Our first headline was, I believe, February 19th. I'm not going to go all the way back to that first slide. It's either the 29th or the 19th. Fear of coronavirus reverberates economically across the entire globe. Well, what were most people doing in March then? A lot of people were dumping their stocks to try to make sure Politicians with inside traders were dumping their stocks, all kinds of stuff hit the news. What were we doing? We were actually starting two hours of broadcast on March the 10th, Tuesday 10 a.m. to 12, Wednesday 10 a.m. to 12, and we've been doing that ever since. Why? Because we heard that everybody who possibly had come into contact with corona was going to actually have to be at home. Many businesses were going to shut down. Schools shut down. So people that are actually looking for an, an, a door of utterance, something that is effectual, 
what would they do? They would start pumping in more information to these poor people who are stuck at home. Can you imagine the stuff that you have to watch on daytime TV? Some people may like the soap operas and stuff like that, but daytime TV is just pretty whatever if you ask me. Here on cable and on YouTube, we were looking at this as people who were looking at the signs of the times. This is not a bad thing, not in my opinion necessarily. You recognize this? I don't know if y'all watched Disney when you were a kid, the Magic Kingdom. We did. I'll tell you, we had to tell a little bit lie in order to get to watch Disney, or we had to be sick, or we had to lie about being sick because it came on on Sunday nights, and we were always at church on Sunday night, and the only way that you got to watch Disney is if you were sick. The Magic Kingdom. What's going on with the Magic Kingdom? Well, used to, you could trust Walt Disney. At least that's what I thought as a child. I have no idea what reality really, really was. I don't know what Walt Disney was up to, but I know what's going on with Walt Disney today. Walt Disney was planning on, Disney was planning on opening their park in June for gay days. Media coverage, this is New York Times, in case you can't see that little uh, line up at the top. This is New York, New York Times. Um, it was July the 11th, front page. Our business section, media coverage of opening days was tightly managed, even by Disney's stringent standards. The company initially said it would give a credential to New York Times photographer for the Magic Kingdom access, but reversed itself late Friday. This was published July 11th and updated the 13th. Now, wait a minute. You remember what I said a bit ago about school not starting and how people are consistently getting these false narratives and thinking things are going to get better? and that things are going to happen, and this is going to open, and that's going to open, and everybody had tickets to gay days at Disney. Now, why am I bringing this up? Y'all, have we not been complaining for years? Do we even complain anymore? 1990, this was to be the 30th anniversary of gay, day, gay, gay days. That would be 1990 to now. I definitely remember 1990 when the Magic Kingdom opened its doors for the first time and it was basically gay day. It was not just the Magic Kingdom, it was, it was Universal Studio, it was all the theme parks. And whether you know this or not, factually, the theme parks did not sponsor it, the city of Orlando did, and the theme parks just, they perpetrated it or they facilitated it. They don't really uh, openly, are not really openly behind this. Now, you might say, why would they do that? And why does it continue? Well, here's an advertisement that is on Gay Days. It's on a website called gaydays.com, and it will tell you why these Universal Studios and these different ones are actually so intent on having a 30th anniversary or even the first one in 1990. Here it is. They're trying to get vendors to come and participate in, in uh, Disney's Gay Days and or any other event, and here's what they're saying about the homosexual community. 78% prefer to buy from companies that advertise to the gay market. 68% upgrade to a product's latest model. 57% prefer to buy top of the line. 77% believe in, in, believe in indulging in themselves. Twice as likely to have household income over 60,000, twice as likely to have graduated from college, these are smart, rich folks who like to indulge in themselves. Three times more likely to be online than Amer average an American and twice as likely to spend $250 on cellular service. Well, that's a family plan. Give it up. Homosexuals don't have families. These are individuals that are spending $250 on an individual cellular plan. You're trying to get yours under $40? Everything under $40 with the different plans they put out, and these folks are spending 200 and twice as likely to spend 250. Have you asked yourself the question, why is it everybody it panders to this crowd? There's your answer right there. These individuals, even though small, are a very particular block, and they are have a lot of money and prestige. Now, what is all of this about? What am I talking about? I'm saying. If you have not been put off, put out, whatever, by the constant barrage, shoving down your throat every time you turn on a show that you used to watch or you're used to, and there is a homosexual on there, 
if you've been wondering, when is it going to stop? It's stopping right now. Coronavirus stopped it. It put a stop to the 30th annual Gay Days Bash. Not only that, if you notice some of the, res the recent rescheduling and the hype that is actually being put out there, in partnership with our Gay Days host, Margarita Resort, and adhering to federal, state, and local CDC guidelines, we have rescheduled Gay Day's 30th anniversary for, uh, for June 2nd to the 8th, 2020, to become Gay Day's Halloween and take place Tuesday, October 27th to Monday, November 2nd. Not going to happen. You see what I'm saying? We said a moment ago, individuals are tired. Now, I'm not tired of hearing this. I like to hear a whole lot more of this. But they're tired of hearing things like school's going to open up, and it doesn't. They reschedule for Halloween. So did Universal Studios. They rescheduled their events for, they call it Horror Night. They started uh, saying that they were going to have Horror Night beginning in August and go all the way to uh, Halloween. And they hired a bunch of extra staff. And you know what they did? They wasted a lot of money because they're not going to do it. Neither is Disney. Here's one of the latest uh, let me see, here's Gay Days telling that it's not going to happen. We have rescheduled Gay Days Halloween 30th anniversary event scheduled for October 22nd to November 22nd. It will become Gay Days Disco Inferno in 2021. Not taking place on Halloween. Man, I would not want to call my event Inferno anything if I were putting together a homosexual event. Gay Days Inferno, sorry, Disco Inferno. But notice this. Jeremiah in 24 is where we were reading about the Smiths and the Jones, the carpenters going to Babylon and they're going to be taken care of. Jeremiah gives the reason why that the temple's going to be burned and these other individuals are going to suffer. In the next chapter, he says, From the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, Am Ammon, king of Judah, even unto this day, that is, the 3 and 20th year, the word of the Lord hath come Come unto me, and I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but you have not hearkened. Twenty-three years, and they wouldn't listen. Since 1990, 30 years now, and nothing, has anything slowed this train down? No. Well, Corona did. And so, when we start thinking about the times, we're pumping out more information. This is a part of the information. And it has slowed this down. I know this sermon gets weirder and weirder. I ask you, what would you think with the, if the headlines said, Smiths go to Babylon, and then what is the door? Holy Kool-Aid! Well, when you're trying to get attention, anything, lots of different things work. I don't know if holykool-aid.com worked or not, but it got me there. This is a website that the particular individual that's running the website actually put together a list of conferences for 2020 for all atheists, skeptics, and humanists. Now, y'all, I have to admit, I'm a bit skeptical about what's going to happen in 2020. What about y'all? He put this together in the early days of January, possibly even last year, and I have been to the website several different times and as you go down through here i'm not going to do it now because the wi-fi up here is not so great but you start looking at these different events and what you're going to do is you're going to click on them the skepticals that were supposed to be at berkeley california they became very skeptical they didn't do it they canceled it new york city any con uh, conference on science and skepticism canceled the big tent pacific north West Secular AA Conference, May 16th, canceled. I don't know about these cruises. It's pretty hard to find information on a cruise, but I don't think I'd want to be on a cruise like that, do you? You see what we've been actually saying? I'm not comparing the homosexual community to atheists. If I did not go to the Church of Christ, I would be an atheist, a skeptic, or a humanist myself. Because all this foolishness that you actually see out there, like... Just for instant breaking news, Lawrence Campbell's daughter-in-law died in the last two weeks. Larry Campbell's wife. Larry Campbell is assistant pastor 
for Bible Way Cathedral, whose pastor is Lawrence Campbell, and he's the apostle of the world. And all the healing power that's supposed to be from there. And he actually made a prophecy last week on his radio broadcast that an antidote for coronavirus was coming sooner than you think. He's a prophet. Why didn't he tell Lawrence Campbell's wife that she was going to get corona? You see what I'm saying? It's no wonder more people are not skeptical and more people and more people are becoming because the foolishness that they're seeing now. But just notice my point. I don't know. I hate uh, coronavirus just as much as anybody else, but I don't want to be hating on God. I don't want to be hating on the idea that God could actually be presenting a door of opportunity and we need to be going through it. We need to be more vocal. We need to encourage people to realize that even though there's not a lot of us, there are people here. We're giving out information that would help individuals to be taught, replacing myths and things of that nature. And so that's a door of opportunity. Here's another. Now, you talking about the tip top of white supremacy? Here it is. You don't have to wear a hood in order to be a racist individual and spewing forth that garbage. Jerry Falwell Jr. just resigned on Friday. Liberty University's president and chancellor replaced his daddy, Jerry Falwell Sr. Man, how in the world? When I think about the back and forth that we've had with them and the different things that go on associated with being in the shadow of Liberty University and all the Baptists, and Jerry Falwell Sr. had some compromising pictures on a yacht, acting out some very salacious behavior, lascivious behavior, and the board finally calls for him to resign. You know what? This is a school that has 15,000 students on campus and another 100,000 online. It's the biggest religious school in the United States. And guess what? Jerry Falwell Jr. said Liberty will open its doors for school. And they did. And 2,000 people came, and that's all. Now, I'm saying that's some good news to me. How'd that happen? Corona shuts down effectively, you might as well say, Liberty University with the exception of the online school. And so this morning when we're trying to actually consider how it is that we should think, we should think that it's time for us to have a look at the means by which we actually make our decisions and build our thinking process. And this morning, if it is the case that all of the things that we have had put in our head, if you're a good Christian person, good things will happen to you. Good is a relative term also. Are these things good? Is it a good opportunity that we're getting to put, to put all kinds of information into people's house and our YouTube is going all over the United States with over two million views? People are just, they're lapping it up at times like these. And this morning, I hope that you're encouraged to realize that we should be giving God glory no matter what's going on, whether the Smiths are going to Babylon or whether Corona has hit our area. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without, without end. Amen. If you're here this morning and your life isn't like what we've just said, the mythological stuff has replaced reality and you need encouragement, you don't have to say you need encouragement now. You can just say you need encouragement anytime. I thought about calling a couple of different individuals. I never know how busy people are and what they're doing just to check on them this week. I'm talking about people that are sitting here right now. You don't have to be dealing with whatever you're dealing with by yourself if you're willing to share. And if this morning, if you need prayers, want to share that, want us to pray one for another, why don't you do so? Come forward while we stand and sing.